Hello everyone, today we read and comment the fifth chapter of the third book of von Clausewitz von Krieg, the title being Military Virtue of an Army. The text follows. This is distinguished from mere bravery and still more from enthusiasm for the business of war. The first is certainly a necessary constituent part of it, but in the same way as bravery, which is a natural gift in some men, may arise in a soldier as a part of an army from habit and custom, so with him um, it must also have a different direction from that which it has with others. It must lose that impulse to unbridled activity and exercise a force which is characteristic in the individual and submit itself to demands of a higher kind, the obedience, order, rule and method. Enthusiasm for the profession gives life and greater fire to the military virtue of an army, but does not necessarily constitute a part of it. War is a special business, and however general its relations may be, and even if all the male population of a country capable of bearing arms exercise this calling, still it always continues to be different and separate from the other pursuits which occupy the life of a man. To be imbued with a sense of the spirit and nature of this business, to make use of, to rouse, to assimilate into the system the powers which should be active in it, to penetrate completely into the nature of the business which, uh, with the understanding, through exercise to gain confidence and expertness in it, to be completely given up to it, to pass out of the man into the part which it is assigned to us to play in war, this is the military virtue of an army in the individual. However much pains may be taken to combine the soldier and the citizen in one and the same individual, whatever may be done to nationalize wars, and however much we may imagine times have changed since the days of the old condottieri, never will it be possible to do away with the individuality of the business, and if that cannot be done, then those who belong to it, as long as they belong to it, will always look upon themselves as a kind of guild in the regulations, laws and customs in which the spirit of war by preference finds its expression. And so it is, in fact, even with the most decided inclination to look at war from the highest point of view, it would be very wrong to look down upon this corporate spirit, esprit de corps, which may and should exist more or less in every army. This corporate spirit forms the bond of union between the natural forces which are active in that which we have called military virtue. The crystals of military virtue have a greater affinity for the spirit of a corporate body than for anything else. An army which preserves its usual formations under the heaviest fire, which is never shaken by imaginary fears, and in the face of real danger disputes the ground inch by inch, which, proud in the feeling, of its victories never loses its sense of obedience, its respect for and confidence in its leaders, even under the depressing effects of defeat, an army with all its physical powers in, in, uh, inured to privations and fatigue by exercise, like the muscles of an athlete, an army which looks upon all its toils and the means of victory not as a curse which hovers over its standards and which is always reminded of its duties and virtue by sort um, the short catechism of one idea, namely the honor of its arms, such as an army is imbued with the true military spirit. Soldiers may fight bravely like the Vandans and do great things like the Swiss, the Americans or Spaniards, but without displaying this military virtue. A commander may also be successful at the head of standing armies like Eugene and Marlborough without enjoying the benefit of its assistance. We must not therefore say that a successful war without it cannot be imagined, and we draw a special attention to that point in order the more to individualize the conception which is here brought forward that the idea may not dissolve into a generation and that it may not be thought that military virtue is in the end everything. It is not so. Military virtue in any army is a definite moral power which may be supposed wanting and the influence of which may therefore be estimated like an instrument, the power which 
may be calculated. So today we comment actually just the first half of the chapter because it, it it's very beautiful to uh, read it all in one row. But I think it's important to conceptualize the division that von Clausewitz in fact operates as, you know, if you read on fundamentally, um, von Clausewitz ex starts explaining after this uh, expressly now how to produce these military virtues in an army, right? So to see how this develops concretely and how you can, um, you know, cultivate it in a way, right? As you know, moral forces are naturally uh, largely escaping the control, uh, especially you know when when they are you know part of great masses that are exposed to very complex systems, and uh, you know we we can't dominate this naturally, even if, if we are the commanders completely. But the point, though, is that these are military virtues, as von Clausewitz says, um, that can be uh, developed over time, that can actually uh, lack, that uh, are, are measurable in a way, right, that they are not completely, you know, although they are moral forces, as we've seen also from the previous chapters, they're not... Um, you know, uh, difficult to objectivize for for a person in the measure that you know at least makes you understand, you know, whether you're dealing in this case with a with a, um, a seasoned arm, right? Or if you are uh, just with uh, in front of rookies, and 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 this naturally has an impact in in the theory of the art of war and how war war is waged. Um, and von Clausewitz also introduces, or at least you know, explains better. From previous, um, from previous chapters, the uh, let's say, or from previous books also, right? Because here it he even resumes these concepts of the, the military virtue and the individu individual fundamental, and how they, you know, th there are certain specific characters that must be, you know, uh, combined in order to have a good, um, a good man of war, right? But here distinguishes even better, and throughout all the, the chapter, actually, we'll see it better next time, the, the obvious difference that we stress all the time between the soldier and the warrior, right? We, we are facing, you know, a historical period which, for some reasons that we don't have the time to explain, that the concept of warrior, right, is being uh, superimposed to the one of soldier, as if that was actually a positive thing or even an effective thing in the first place, um, and it was a real thing. I've, I've heard many military men would who bought this um, terminology, and uh, and naturally that you know didn't know much about von Clausewitz in the first place, and and that stressed these things because because of essentially political reasons, right? It, it's not about you know a realistic awareness about the theory of the art of war as such. And let's always stress that this work has literally nothing to do with, um, uh, you know, pretending that um, being uh, part of, of the military actually equates to understand these things automatically speaking. And this is also a very low, cheap, superficial way of interpreting uh, war that is extremely widespread today, that is just looking at the emotionalistic side of war. And in fact, probably it's from this background that the concept of warriors being revived, right? Because that's such a primitive and easy and instinctive um, concept that it, it comes out I immediately, and and it actually doesn't help a great deal, right? And when you see all these supposed experts that talk about, you know, what, what those few things you need to do to be successful, like in war as much as in business, all this stuff, you know, it's. Um, it's disturbing because you know certain things can even be fair, but uh, the concept is that if you get down to to very simple elements and you pretend that this is uh, somewhat a magic formula that will f fix your life, not just you know a wage war, <laughs> but you know just fix your life, right? Uh, well, it, it's much easier, for, by the way, to fix a life than to f fix war in this regard. So, I'm sorry, but that will never neither work for for fixing your life, <laughs> because you know, guess what? It, it, if that, it was that simple, we would already figured that out. Um, this is not to say that you can't take good examples, even you know, good uh, advice um, from you know, people who reason with uh, on this level of horizon. There's still some wisdom somewhere, but this is virtually insignificant when you have to deal with 
with war, with the theory of the art of war, and and with military history as well. And the, I mean, the military experience in terms of you know um, understanding, or you know, hoping to understand at least enough, well enough, what happened in order to draw a lesson, right, a practical lesson from it that goes aside, you know, just stay alert and try to be, you know, always more active than, you know, a step ahead of your enemy. Yeah, but, you know, that's a word, right? How this translates into reality is sometimes you simply can't do that, right? So there are certain situations in which you're done for anyway. Um, and 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 this is important because you realize if the, if you cross out the you know failure equation, there is not just you know the risk in it, but I mean the concept that things can always go wrong even if you make the best choices, right? And t may theoretically also go the, at the worst, independently from that. That's an extreme, right? What's one somewhat absolutistic, but. Um, what you need is not a set of of notion of behavioral you know tips what you need is a sound lifetime of learning about this stuff and it doesn't matter whether you're a military man or a civilian right it's obvious that the military man is advantaged in this as von Clausewitz makes pretty much clear but at the same time there is a level of understanding that naturally has to do with with the rank for which as contrarily-wise to what we, we like to idealize for for moralistic reasons. Um, I don't know how well, um, you know, I don't know even precisely h why driven is such, why, you know, eventually uh, objectivizes some sort of factual reality. Um, this The individual soldier, the, the common private, is frankly th the person that albeit maybe suffering physically the most, I mean, from a materially the most, let's put it in this way, is actually the person that knows war the least, right? And there is a reason why we have a hierarchy in the military, and we, there is a reason why, uh, you know, uh, commander-in-chiefs are also taught and trained in, in a specific way that, that has to consider a, a much broader reality than just what happens the range of action of an individual soldier but we must keep doing this all, all over the place right you know telling always even look at movies right it's it's the same old story it's the teeming young man that goes to war and looks at how horrible it is but it, at the end of the day m makes it to become a hero that that's the nutshell right of, of our narrative about what we would like to know about war and, and then we say oh well they want, there is the one we didn't make it let's let's remember that like, yeah let's always remember yeah and then not even studying history not even studying politics guess what studying you know military action um, is is not enough you should be consistent with going on uh, understanding why that happened in the first place going at the roots of the political causes of that passing through all the chain, which is an excruciating pain in the sense that you have to learn an enormous amount of stuff. It's difficult. Most people don't even approach this in their life. Even those who would try, not even be, and being an historian or military historian necessarily means to actually have done, passed through all the various, you know, stages of this because, unfortunately, and oh, we are opening too many parentheses here, but even in here, the, the, um, this ability of synthesis that a man like von Clausewitz had that is able to really show you all the steps and understanding its deepest connections um, and talking about war as it in in uh, in general right this is all like what war is in general but still understanding what the, the generality actually founds what happens in reality right and and this is a huge deal Right, and this is an enormous work, by the way. So, yeah, it's in general, but dealing this stuff at levels of, let's say, intellectual development that most people do, do not even get in their life. It, it's very easy, right? Ask a random, you know, if you're confident with von Clausewitz, you 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 know him fairly fairly well. Just try to present certain concepts that he makes to. The average person that can be maybe even someone who I don't know or do it there's people that specifically pretend to know history or to know warfare right and, and and look at their reactions on average to what is said here 
these are not immediate um, intuitive thoughts this stem from a very um, complex and long um, it's actually yeah it's complex but it's also fairly simple overall um, in, in but still a chain of passages that all stem in the case of phone clause it's also from you know a, a massive military direct military experience but also massive military historical study right um, and this is I think as an introduction it's worth to um, you know to, to address as a to, ex to express in the first place because of, of this thing being introduced about the thing of the warrior right von Clausewitz starts this chapter military virtue of an army saying that this the military virtue of an army is distinguished from mere bravery right and still more from enthusiasm for the business of war this is also another slight prejudice that exists is that you know uh, people who win it's because they are brave right and this is also kind of a warrior tribal like mindset in the sense you know what what does the warrior have to prove you know in uh, you know uh, tribal society warrior societies were uh, when i say warrior society I don't say that you know civilizations are not military uh, like right this is not the point right that's what culturalists say and that's disgusting frankly um but all what the warrior has is courage because its political and social structures do not confer him the capacity to develop a more sophisticated military thinking we were discussing it uh, the other day about the transition between from the ancient Führer to the medieval courage uh, we were talking about this actually also when uh, anyway um, I don't remember but um, we have addressed it countless time also very much in the past um, and um, and this is the, the idea that's st still out there. Why do you think that a country won a war? Because ah, oh, because we were brave, right? You know, and the others were scum. And, and, and this, they don't think this is something that um, is being completely erased from. Look, take a tour on uh, if you are you know a millennial like me that you know grew up a little bit with YouTube and you you have if you have clicked and you do know that. Um, in any World War II video and, and read the comments, you, you, you know what you're going to find there. You know what, what's the concept. The idea is that one, one people is scum because it's covert and another is great because it's, it's, uh, it's brave, right? And, and the point there is um, that even when there is the acknowledgement of you know, something more complex than this, still this tribalistic mindset is 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 used to 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 find it even further right to say oh yes they also say that these people were skilled because they had a kind of you know sophisticated military thinking but well, let's not bother ourselves to understand when what that actually consisted let's simply think that this was an inoxidable you know character that certain specific countries always had because of some who knows which reasons because if you don't you know um uh, degrade into racism, uh, not even nationalism as such, because that wouldn't explain it. In racism, there is no other option. You would, you you, you cannot accept, right? So these are very disturbing and very dangerous thoughts that are still very very widespread. And I wish I could say that uh, leaving, I, I presume, in in, in really, I, I'm convinced of this, uh, in, in the West as the best part of the world in in terms of moral. Uh, you know, a moral education of civic values in democratic culture. Um, I wouldn't like to say it, but these thoughts are are all over the place, right? They're still, even if they are, maybe they're not so dangerous as you know, a bunch of frustrated people need to do when venting on a on on a site uh, like YouTube, like kids or you know, I don't know, but. but uh, these things can be inflamed at the point that the whole thing can escalate quite brutally, and lots of problems that happen in our societies uh, happen as a co you know as a, um, you know because of this and as a reaction to this as well, right? And and all stems from ignorance fundamentally because it doesn't even take to study from Clausewitz like it, it should be proper people who uh, you know address military history in a non war gamistic way. Right, as a as a level of awareness, um, and von Klose, by the way, blasts this kind of thinking. Also, in the second half of the video, we'll talk. Uh, oh, excuse me, of the chapter, we will discuss, like cyclically, we do in, in in three days, I hope. 
Um, and uh, but this is also uh, an important idea, and it's also very fascinating that von Clausewitz distinguishes between mere bravery from enthusiasm for business of war. Right? There are. Um, this is very subtle, right? Being enthusiastic for war, and this is uh, what look at World War II. Look at the countries that basically brought to it, and look at you know what they did before entering. To, uh, I mean, entering to war, all thinking, "Oh yeah, we will do that." They were raised to the ground, <laughs> right? And so, and um, and, and the concept there is that the bravery is even detached from it. Right, it's not necessarily the one who shouts the most that is more angry, that is more violent, that even has more bravery uh, as such. Right, it's not that if you're a fanatic nationalist, you're necessarily a courageous person, per se. Actually, you know, probably that fanatism stems from some complex of inferiority from the other side because there is something bad about it. It's not, it's you know, it's not even here. Um, the, the 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 a low right, but sometimes it happens. If it's the same here, as well, maybe more than sometimes. Um, and uh, von Clausewitz says the first that his mere bravery is certainly a necessary constituent of the the military virtue of an army, right? Nobody said that that courage uh, is 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 unnecessary, right? We have seen it in in the um, in the in the I think it was the second book. Um, in which, or maybe the third, no, it was, I think it was still the end of the first, in which von Clausewitz addresses those, mm, let's say, characters, those um, feelings, right, that, that uh, we can have by temperament uh, as individuals. And uh, he made this pretty accurate and, you know, a changing, let's say, cross section of, of a cycle of, you know, of at least of those feelings that are more or less useful in order to become a good man of war, right? Um, and, um, and definitely bravery is part of this, but von Clausewitz also showed us that albeit is kind of noble, right, to sacrifice yourself in this form of courage and etc. That is not necessarily leading you anywhere if you don't couple to it some, some other very important uh, characters. First of all, courage itself should be essentially not just, you know, Uneasy. There are different forms of courage, right? There, there are. There is the the very easily excitable one. So the guy that can literally run after, you know, do something extremely dangerous, but then then be inconsistent with it for for a long time, or you know, even um, just doing it the, the thing uh, with over, uh, you know, w without any other ability like or intelligence that will make him crash anyway again somewhere. The most important form of courage is determination. That is the one of realizing consciously that you're doing something because of you, you have a very specific and, and rational uh, aim to obtain something. And then, therefore, um, you know, essentially making uh, uh, action following thoughts um, in a consistent way. And naturally, rationality and also a, an ability to remain consistent over this time and lots of other, think about the coup d'oeil and this, um, let's say, um, consistency over time with this vision that even though it's perturbed by lots of different factors that come about all, all the way long, you're, you're still following a trail that you have, you know, hopefully identify that your senses in a way tell you that your guts tell you that it's right this talent this intuition as von Clausewitz also calls it that uh, even if it's wrong it's still better to follow than simply you know going back and forth and uh, making the world thing going going nowhere right um, and uh, in bravery here from Clausewitz says that um, excuse me here we were talking about the military virtue of an army right um, and for cause it said, but in the same way as bravery. So bravery is also needed, right, for the military virtue of an arm. And and he stresses it's it's a natural gift in some men, right? It's um, essentially um, a matter of how you were raised and the other characters, even genetics. I mean, something that all the living experiences, all all what has shaped you in that way. Right, and and that's something that is also learned, and uh, it's not fixed. Right, you can change over time. Right, that there can be even think about ages. Right, the age of a soldier is very important because you 
you can't ask a soldier with was 30 years old to do the same thing that an 18 years old would do right there are many psychophysical reasons for this and this is also how in fact in more ancient times where you know societies were simpler th this was more evident even as a functionalization of the army now it's it's somewhat different but still so um and uh, also bravery can arise in a soldier um just as the, the virtue of an army as a wall uh, from habit and custom right so more than than ever in in the military in an army and that especially the one that operates in an actual um in actual combat the this this military virtue basically i mean in combat and, and non i mean just in a campaign right not just like training that is definitely doing that in part as well but more like the the actual business of war the actual waging of of of, of war um the, the military virtue develops right it is it, gotten is acquired can, it can't be taught right because there are certain things that this is also with the part of what von Klaus is saying throughout all the film critics that until you 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 don't try that you you can't truly really know what what the problem what the deal really is and that the whole misconceptions about war in this regard derive largely from the fact that someone thought they could think of war by ab abstracting uh, the theory from the reality by saying let's imagine that let's exclude this factor right and what what's the point of excluding this factor in reality and especially moral forces that as we've seen oh, because we can't calculate them oh, so okay so that's your your answer let's exclude the moral force so that you can have a model that has literally nothing to do with reality because moral forces are the single most important ones uh, in in the world war that has we're discussing here so um, here once again it has nothing to do specifically with the uh, private experience right it's not the general that is commanding from a side that can also command lead from the front by the way but you know this commanding from you know a few tens of kilometers away has a less private experience you know superior because it's under shelling and you know unlike the general who's uh, safe and cozy like tens of kilometers uh, behind the, the the front right you know th that's completely the other way around the general gets the, the best understanding of the world business of war from that position obviously given that he actually gets the, the information is is um, but that this happens normally um, in 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 a military context in a satisfying way um, so um, this is um, I don't remember where I was going this because I interrupted the the, uh, the recording, but uh, yeah, I mean the fact yes here the exp the direct experience here is deriving from all those factors of friction of you know of all the, that un unforeseen that once again is is merely um, you know um, it, it's firstly actually as a, m a moral aspect right because this is not just about how to do things but finding that same spirit here we're we're, t we're dealing with moral forces right you must not just know how to solve a problem you must have the morale to stay there to stand there and, and do what you have to do no matter what and that's the single most difficult thing right it's not disjuncted from the material side of the story but without the moral um, conception in here and this is what truly distinguishes the soldier from the other men but also the other fighters here that's an important distinction right and we'll see it better later um, to say that it, it doesn't suffice to be trained and to be sent to the front line to, to know at, at its fullest what the, the matter out there really is Right, that's why experience is so important, um, and it can't be seen as okay. That's that's less. That's less important. That's less, um, you know, somewhat uh, secondary. You can't pretend that um, this whole thing has not to do with that. There are situations, as we will see, in which this 
you know, maybe you can even do without that. You can even win wars without that. Yes, you can. This is also what we must get pretty clear in here, that there is no magic formula to win a all moment. There is no specific character here that is really what you must get so that you can win. Because you will never know whether you can win or not. You can be the best soldier, you can be in the best army, you can have the better spread of corp altogether. You can still be dead pretty easily and quickly, right? And it happened countless times, historically speaking. Um, also, von Clausewitz writes, it must lose that impulse to unbridled activity and exercise of force which is characteristic in, in the individual and submit itself to demands of a higher kind, to obedience, order, rule and method. If you wonder what's the difference between a warrior and a soldier, here we're starting to really um, focus on it. Right here, there is this sort of um, uncha an unrestrained um, uh, impetus that everybody can have, literally everybody can have, right? And that's why we talk bad of warriors and tribal populations in comparison to the civilized ones, right? Of, of soldiers of, um, uh, of, of a civilization, because they all stem from their own context. There is nothing, let's say, intrinsically better wars in, in, in each other. But as a military model, the war the one of the warrior succumbs. It's not superior. And the cult of the individual as a single de person detached from the others that will get there as the greatest warrior that will kick ass. It it's been surpassed by civilization by slaughtering and making a an enormous bath of blood, those same warriors that in front of, of, us, of soldiers were annihilated on a regular base. And there is no escape here. So if you get pumped about that model, just know that it's, it's the inferior model on a military scale. Because on average, it, it, it fails. Um, in, in comparison to to a civilized one, right? So even the myth that eventually the, the warriors take over, right? Because you see, during the migration era, well, what happened is that the Romans grew weak and they weren't like warriors anymore, so the warriors came and they defeated them. No, if, if anything, it's the other way around, is that the warriors began to be something else, um, and especially when they became kind of Roman themselves. Uh, also, when, guess what? Um, if a state crumbles and a, and a people lacks its own political unity, others benefit of it. And they don't necessarily create something that surpasses that for good, right? If there is a crisis and a contraction and things get simpler, you know, you, get, you revert to some kind of more tribal-like models from which other things can, can, can transform. In fact, the video we did exactly the other day was, was showing this, right? We were talking about the, the, the ancient warrior and the, the medieval knight. The medieval knight is not uh, a soldier as we would define. It has a lot of, a lot of elements of, of, of warriorhood and of soldierhood. I don't know even how to define this. Um, but it, it's evidently uh, better than the warrior as a model, because that world medieval civilization was definitely more advanced than the tribal one from which it had partly originated, and what got it also, you know, kind of in a more effective way, stemmed from civilizations that were, uh, uh, you know, above that. So, also, the myth of, uh, you know, the warrior that eventually always wins because it's the pure good one is is something historically wrong. Even if you look at the establishment of the Romano-Germanic kingdoms, they largely passed actually through the ostracization from power at best, for not saying the extermination sometimes, of those who opposed the centralization and this kind of uh, more, um, you know, more mm, oppressive rule from and discipline from the top, you know, from, from with an order, with a hierarchy, with a certification. So it was not a victory of, of of the tribe over the state, right? It was just uh, a crisis of the state 
the tribes remaining were at the level that they were, but getting kind of, you know, better on the base of the ruins of, of civilization and, and of the state that they were trying to emulate, because obviously they, they realized how advanced it was compared to them. So, von Clausewitz then, and, and what is that makes the difference here, of course, this demands of higher kind, as he calls them, that is that are obedience, order, rule, and method. And you see, here there is no strict uh, separation between, uh, you know, uh, a civilized society or a tribal one, in the sense that they, uh, uh, these factors all operate, right? Because already tribes can be a civilization compared to something less, right? There were tribes that functioned better because they were kind of more driven, they were more uh, more cohesive, right? And this gave them um, a superiority that allowed them to rise over others. So von Clausewitz is not distinguishing at all, like many would, would like to think, by like saying, you know, here's just talking about uh, from a, you know, uh, superiority complex um, perspective of, of the guy, you know, that, that led 19th century armies, right? He's saying that in every, in every society, there are these factors that you can find, in fact, even in tribal one, but, you know, much less emphasized and organically fused, such as obedience, order, rule, method, right? You could say, oh, well, these things um, uh, already existed everywhere. No, not not in the, the same measure in which in a civilization this is done. Because the kind of coercive power that you can find I don't know, in a Roman legion imposes this stuff in a way that a tribal warrior can, can just dream of in his own society. Not because they can't, they don't know the value of obedience or of order or of a rule or of method, because guess what, that's a human uh, capacity that we all have, but to have it more intensely and um, developed and, and linked to form a, an organic system with, in this sense, quantitative and qualitative superiority, well, that's not. And von Clausewitz writes, enthusiasm for the profession gives life and greater fire to the military virtue of an army, but does not necessarily constitute a part of it. So that is also to say, of course, professionalism is an important turning point uh, when you think of what is that makes an army effective. Uh, there is, in this sense, if something is repeated over and over again, naturally, uh, there's going to be a, a fluidification of how an army works and, and a greater dedication and commitment and and in confidence with the whole business. But the military virtue is um, is something more than that, right? It, it's a, an extra intensification of, of the mechanisms that make this army work properly, right? And all together, uh, as a sole body, let's say, and uh, with with a very sound and driven um, motivation and morale, right? And von Clausewitz writes, war is a special business, and however general its relations may be, and even if all the male population of a country capable of bearing arms exercise this calling, certainly it always continues to be different and separate from the pursuits which occupy the life of a man. Right, so... Uh, war is something very peculiar in its own kind, right? It distinguishes itself from any other human activity, and even if you commit an entire people to war, you you're not going necessarily to to have by itself um, that level of com you know of of moral um, f uh, strength to achieve a military virtue per se. From Clausewitz is saying this because naturally he had measured during the Napoleonic era, the the effect of a of a mass levy of troops, um, even of nationwide, that is still yet by itself, without any further characteristic, not uh, what automatically makes the the soldier. Right. This is important because uh, von Clausewitz was actually an advocate for the national levy right, in that the historical period um, for for what was needed. 
um, for as a system against other systems that had proved to be successful in that regard and because of political and social reasons not as as many uh, you know just as military um, models per se right and then von Clausewitz enumerates what really constitutes the military virtue of an army in the individual it says to be imbued with a sense of the spirit and nature of this business that is essentially not just thinking to be there by chance but being fully committed to the military craft as such right whichever the motivation can be right you don't necessarily have to in here there is no absolute specificity but in in, in the moral commitment that why we are dealing with moral forces in these chapters um, then to make use of, to rouse, to assimilate into the system the powers which should be ac active in it. That is to say, you it's not just about saying, okay, let, let's do this, let's go. You have to awaken within yourself certain feelings that sh that at some point you even will have wished not to have done. Um, and that um, that you have to come to, to, to animate completely, right? And to be aware that this world thing is is directed to a very specific purpose for which you are animated right no n n not the, n let's say a, a simply mechanistic approach but a full commitment right body and, and soul that that's the concept then through exercise to gain confidence and expertness in it yeah, because even if you are you manage to, to get imbued with s s certain feelings, this has nothing to do with, you know, the degree, the breaking point that you may, you know, suffer uh, virtually at every moment during the campaign in the sense that uh, you may not be cut for it anyway. Uh, dr and dramatically so, right? So don't think that uh, people who escape or they're just cowards in the sense or that you know there is a martial law etc it, it's a huge business think about the, the psychological pressure of risking your life constantly and you know think of what th this whole thing means overall uh, you're going to die there and you know that right at least you you know it's, it's a pretty risky business and chances are that you will so just think of about what this means in practice in all the wars that, that are constantly fought uh, since the dawn of mankind, uh, in 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 this regard, I mean, it, this this is not banal. This is not something you could say. Oh well, yeah, I already knew that. Because if you don't stop thinking about what this concretely means, in reality, you you can never be committed to this whole thing yourself, right? Then, to be completely given up to it. Right to pass out of the man into the part which it is assigned to us to play in war. So, this is really a mission that requires a particular devotion, the the, the devotion of your entire self. Right. Let's always remember that this also has naturally an ideal value in the sense that there is never perfection to be achieved in this field either. In here we're we are dealing with moral forces in the, for the third art of war, realizing that it, you know we're we're exemplifying a situation which um, that pertains to to the merely military uh, dimension. That, as we've seen, is not detached in rea in reality. It's always wired to politics, to society. But if we were to abstract this for didactical sake and saying okay let's think about what the military would, would need for itself just for a moment and then thinking how this descends in the real world uh, as a consequence wh while it's connected to all these other reasons you you you, you realize really also you, even why you know think about betrayals think about desertion as a reason well, what is it that is motivating you to not just to to go back obviously but what has motivated up to that point to to be there in the first place and war is 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 dramatic possibly and probably more in th from this point of view than from from a strictly physical one 
even if it you know the, the physical strains are, are much worse but the, the moral one can be uh, overwhelming at the point it's actually m much worse and and much more often than we think this is also from, from Clausewitz insists on that this is not to say oh well I will be scared at that point if I come out of it there that everything will be fine hell we we know that this is not true that that there are huge implications in a in a mental state where, where to have participated to certain actions uh, even just as uh, enlisting I mean I'm not even talking about the fact of you know looking at the horrors of, of combat per se but you know there is all a commitment that you have to to explain in the world cost that this means for you and it's not easy but the, the military historian must know this thing as much as the commander must know these things right there is no um, these are all factors that count eventually in how you're leading this man so that's also why who these men are makes a great difference then von Clausewitz writes however much pains may be taken to combine the soldier and the citizen in one and, s and the same individual whatever may be done to nationalize wars and however much we may imagine times have changed since the days of the old condottieri never will it be possible to do away with the individuality of the business and if that cannot be done then those who belong to it, as long as they belong to it, will always look upon themselves as a kind of guilt in the regulations, laws and customs which the spirit of war, by preference, find its expression. Right. So even if the time as war and politics and society change, um, the um, commitment of the individual to this uh, task never comes less per se. Right, and this is reflected in the esprit de corps. Right, so this military virtue right passes from the individuality to the collectivity of of the arm. Right, from the individuality of the soldier to the collectivity of the arm, and this cannot be, um, you know, in fact, conceived without the individual commitment per se. Right, so this is these are forces that tend eventually to work as if they were all by themselves but they always stem naturally from the the individual commitment right this thing can um, break down suddenly right because of specific situations especially when you bring someone um, in, in an army that has no motivation whatsoever you can keep uh, him by coercion in it but uh, that will require many more forces that will have to compensate for this lack of individual commitment and the uh, disasters will eventually break down much more violently than before because it's as if there was a, a negative force here that is tearing the whole thing apart and you have to count um, but uh, we will see those aspects especially in the next video um, and uh, von Clausewitz then writes this corporate spirit forms the bond of union between the natural forces which are active in that which we have called military virtue right so all those um, you know com you know actions of commitment and of, of development and of of devotion uh, find um, essentially an amplifier an amplification within the esprit de corps per se so within the esprit de corps dwell this the, the, this mil dwells this military virtue and that's where you can cultivate it further so it's as if this naturally this body had a um, a moral on its own right the army has a moral per se right it's always composed by many people but still uh, they all interfere with each other at the point that there, there is a, uh, a a coherence, a cohesion, and and a substance to this whole system. That it's as if it like it live on 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 its own, right? 
and it's a corporate spirit. And Van Clausewitz writes, the crystals of military virtue have a greater affinity for the spirit of a corporate body than for anything else, right? So you can't pretend either to, let's say, uh, uh, obtain a, uh, a great result, not just in the military, but also in life, if you don't feel yourself as driven as a part of a wall. Right, you it can't be just an individualistic take. That's what a, a warrior, with its uh, egoism and charisma, and selfishness would do. The warrior essentially fights for himself. The soldier fights for for the army, which is a wholly different thing, and and it's extremely more powerful and and coherent and systematic than than what a warrior fights for. This is where the great mistake actually stands when you think about why a warrior is, you know, a surpassed model that it should not find place in our society, if not to great danger of the same. Um, or maybe not danger of the same uh, consequentially, but simply because it implies that the, the same level of society has sunk to the point we produce warriors and not soldiers or even ci citizen soldiers anymore. Here there is an important distinction also between citizen and soldier at the same time. There, there are excellent soldiers in this regard that know nothing about civic values. Right? Being a good soldier doesn't mean being a, you know, uh, democratically educated person. There are great soldiers that are, were, you know, the greatest comebacks of humanity in this regard. So even the respect, for example, we, we constantly try to, to, to the soldier per se, is, yeah, you can praise the, the nobility of certain feeling of courage or bravery, and by the way, what the hell do you know in, in whose grave you're standing in front um, most of the times, but, you know, if these people were fighting, like, for exterminating another one that had, I mean, for, for reasons that, you know, are pretty morally debatable, in the first place, why should you try but why should you separate as a, as a human being, as a thinking being, that uh, commitment to the mere military prowess of it? Right, where's the deal? Right, are you a warrior yourself? That is, you you try that just to the fact. Oh, look at that guy. He he, you know, took fifty men to get with him before dying. Right, you're okay, but what what is was he fighting for? Right, you can admire him legitimately, but respecting simply the, uh, I mean, the, the, the fact that he's dead, so we should think they were all alike, they were all fighting for their country, right? Yeah, they were doing that. No, they were not all fighting for that country, because that country at that point could have been a totalitarianism. And you have to deal with that. And no, it doesn't work once again with the fact that, you know, if you go to work uh, uh, under totalitarianism, it's because you have been just forced to do it. Because totalitarianism, guess what, affirm themselves because people bring them to power. Always. And, it c and there is no government that can hold without that control. So never uh, underestimate the, the, the responsibility affiliation um, uh, and the, the responsibility, I mean, in general, and the affiliation of every soldier also to the political mandate that they're serving, right? You you can't disjunct the two things unless you're not basically dissectioning and killing the, the theory of the art of war per se, right? That's That doesn't render, it's not very flattering for your understanding, and this is not just the military one, right? Um, but this is a complex. Uh, it has a lot of implications. We should really, I would should find the, the you know, the, the the foolishness to to make a video about uh, a thorough video about this this topics because it sounds always as if you know, I say that, and eventually I never expand as if you know I, I wasn't fully explaining what I mean, or trying to to demonstrate more directly what uh, what I'm talking about, but. We may do it. Then, F von Clausewitz writes, an army which preserves its usual formations under the heaviest fire, which is never shaken by imaginary fears, and the face of real danger disputes the ground inch by inch, 
which, proud in the feeling of its victories, never loses its sense of obedience, its respect for and confidence in its leaders, even under the depressing effects of defeat. An army with all its physical powers injured, uh, inured excuse me, to privations and fatigue by exercise. Like the muscles of an athlete, an army which looks upon all its toils as the means to victory, not as a course which hovers over its standards, and which is always reminded of its duties and virtues by the short catechism of one idea, namely the honor of its arms. Such an army is imbued with the true military spirit. It's a beautiful, beautiful phrase that addresses in a crescendo many, many important um, aspects, you know, starting from the, apparently, the, the, the you know, you know, what wouldn't appear actually as the least trivial, but in proportion they are. It starts from physical ones. It says, you know, just, you know, those, f that army that preserves its usual formation under the heaviest fire. Right? Once again, why do they do that? Is it because they're just piled well and they <laughs> don't change? It's obviously because they are driven. It's obviously because they know they are dying under the heaviest fire, but they will maintain formation anyway. Why? Because they fully understand what that is going to, to bring. If they remain united, there are many more chances not to die than just running away under that heavy fire. Right? Th this, this requires... Uh, um, you know, this is probably a moral force, of course, but it, it, it's... Um, it's a deep realization, right? It, it really requires your full commitment and devotion. This is not something you can think by saying, okay, well, just look, lose some money. Here, here you're going to die, but you're still going to do it for statistically. It's, it's a game, it's a gamble, right? But for the wall, because you know you're tied to the wall, and there are more chances for you within, if the wall succeeds, even if you sacrifice yourself for it paradoxically then if you destroy the the wall as such then this other very important aspect you know an army which is never shaken by imaginary fears you know imaginary fears are all over right we all have imaginary fears Th these are there are so many mottos and, and quotes you could, you could um, write um, Caesar these are all concepts that, that date back to the ancient world you know, people fear largely, mostly what they don't know, right? And in front of the the real danger, the real threat, they say, okay, well, you know, um, okay, but what about my imaginary fear, right? And they lose track of reality. So if you have found yourself in such situations, and, and the media function a little bit like this, because you see, those are, ima those are informations that project to you, you know, sometimes all what you know about the world. And if you are inflated with that, and you, you simply don't have much experience in the field that the media is, is, is infor theoretically informing you of, you're going to feel, oh my god, think about all the times that, you know, now uh, Trump should have, uh, you know, brought us to, to, to fight World War III. And there are millions of people worldwide who were convinced that this was even real, right? So, you at that point, uh, aside from, you, you couldn't understand it just politically that it's not the case, but if you had just even looked at, uh, I don't know, just international relations between, the, in between you know, the, the various countries in the world, how, how do you think at this point that would have been a real thing? And, and the reason is because millions of people actually don't, do not know anything, nor about politics, nor about war, nor about society. They, they don't study military history, they don't study history in the first place. They don't get that, once they, as von Clausewitz himself says, war is not like just, you know, the flash of a moment, you know, it breaks out immediately, or suddenly, without any, you know, there is a long... Um, set chain of events that brings to that sometimes unexpectedly in the sense that for for its consequences maybe it wasn't expected but given a certain equilibrium of powers you know it, it's pretty unlikely and I mean pretty unlikely that something like that could ever happen in the first place uh, so the point von Clausewitz is making here is that if, if an army has gone through 
perils and perils uh, before, well, they kind of know that, you know, when things start to, to warm up, that's not necessarily the, the, when you have to get scared, right? Because you've seen it many times happening, eventually it didn't happen much. And the thing escalates in a, usually in a much more consistent way that can be, if not foreseen, but, you know, perceived in the moment in which is happening, for real. And this happens exactly through this experience, this, you know, sum of, um, of, of knowledge at the end of the day of what has already happened to you before, right? So, once again, it could even happen something catches you by surprise, but still, um, when there are forces involved that you hadn't conceived up to that point. And normally, you know, if you're fighting against an enemy, you, you can more or less expect what, what you can find in front of you in that regard as well. Also, an army that never loses its sense of obedience. Right, this is also very, very important. Here there is a hierarchy. The army is not, uh, you know, la, la commune de Paris, right? The, the, this, this is a, a realm in which if you disobey, you go under martial law. You can't disobey. You must do what you're told, right? The, the, there is a great sense of, you know, how should we consider, for example, even the military service, the military service in, 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 in many contexts, it's, it's also kind of, many people will say, well, this is kind of controversial, okay, we can we could even skip it, I mean, but I mean the concept that now the military men, or at least some um, people believe that a part of the military men should now become more like, I don't know, office people rather than, you know, fighters as such. I mean, the, this broader necessity of kind of leaving the ugly side of the story away, because let's pretend that violence um, is not done by good virtues powers. The military must kill people. It's a duty. It's a moral duty to do so. Right, it's not an option. It's not something you can say. Well, we can fight wars, like trying to kill less people. Von Clausewitz starts um, the um, the von Krieger exactly stating that it's an idiocy in humanitarian terms to pretend that um, you know, in order to spare people's lives, you should kind of fight a, a, a softer kind of war. Right, the the less bloody war, the least bloody war, is, is the quickest. It's the one that unleashes, ideally, all the forces suddenly, just to, to get the, to the point. Uh, in an immediate blood of bath that however in proportion is not comparable to the, uh, you know, the trail of, the endless trail of, 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 of war that prolongs itself for for years and years and years, and we have pretty good examples, just also in the last decades of this. Um, and um, just for saying, we will, you know, we, we, we want to pretend the military should be less kind of fighting-like. What, what's the concept of this? All? I'm not blaming uh, absolutely military culture in this regard, because at least this, this is something that surely military men, but by him or herself, is not very prone to do. But it, th this is mostly an idea that stems from civilians. Um, this is nonsense. This is dangerous. This, this means weakening. Uh, the people who are supposed to, to defend you when someone is going to use violence against you. This is a huge deal, and we have found actually some examples, even just recently, without bringing now to the fore um, the, the event, but what's the point of creating a society where you want to conceal the inherent violence that exists in the political option? If not by essentially letting that violence loose because authority is needed to control violence, right? That's the point. And, and literally meant that he is controlling because you are owning it in a way. Um, and this is naturally also very controversial because there is no satisfactory uh, balance ever from a political point of view uh, in a, you know, a free society. Like how, how should how violent should be our society and in which sense, right? Should be, should we give more power to authority, uh, to 
you know, to the military, to security forces? Should we, you know, rather organize ourselves more locally? You know, these are, you know, th there are wild differences. Even in the Western world, you know, we have, we come from very, very different traditions. Thinking about the Anglo-Saxon one, or the one stemming from the Napoleonic, um, gendarmerie, you know, this, um, th that implies very different political models. Uh, uh, you know, at some point, uh, are also even in this regard, because if you take, I don't know, security forces from, I don't know, from, from the United Kingdom or, or from Spain, like, the, in, in practice, from a properly, even if you don't define a military, and this is a subtle difference, that for cause of it does not exist, because it, it is wrong as a, di as a difference as such, you know, you find it a pretty even from a military point of view. They're the same people, they're kept in the same way, they, they use the same tactics, they have the same training, right? Um, and the point is exactly this, that the, one of the greatest mistakes we do is, is thinking that, you know, mili militarily equates to, you know, one cultural choice. While it's just the, you know, this instrumentalization in a sense you know th that you made an instrument of, of 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 violence as it exists in societies and in politics by default in every single one right and and it's and you have actually made the good accomplishment of rationalizing the fact that that we all need a military because every country in the world has one uh, and and that's a pretty good example about the fact you know that's a very universal thing that violence must be Employ even just as a deterrent, right? Deterrent function, but we need it there, right? Um, so it's um, in this sense, authority, obedience, and whatever happens to you on on the field is not something you can say. I don't want to go there because the enemy will, was driven to harm you. Will do it anyway. So you have to be ready. So you can't deal, you know, the wound that a military man gets to the one, the wound that, that a civilian gets uh, in, in their working place, right? Because the military is meant to get injured, to get wounded, to kill and get killed. That's their job. And we train them for such, and it couldn't be in any other way, right? Uh, you know, a, a worker that, uh, you know, in a construction site that gets hit by a mat and, you know, breaks its shoulder, right? You know, that's another thing. Right, it, it has different political, moral, and social implications. Um, then, uh, then the army, with all its physical powers, uh, inured to privations and fatigue by exercise, like the muscles of an athlete. This is part of previously of the previous reflection, in the sense that uh, an army must by the foe suffer you can't go to wars if you go on, on vacation right you must suffer by definition and not only but you should grow accustomed to it here from Clausewitz, it literally says you have to develop the, the body for it which also in here doesn't mean there is a very specific way of, of doing it right a, a soldier um, is is not meant to be as I often say a bodybuilder as such as a matter of fact, a soldier, as we need it in the military, is is a pretty skinny, uh, thin, but very agile, very you know, flashy. I don't know how to say that guy. The the, the you know, uh, mostly manages to to do things very swiftly, um, and to to not to, to you know to cr be crushed under his own weight or um, to to have an extra um, cost for things that are not necessary to do because you don't need to maintain more than what you need on the field right and being a bodybuilder will not do that right you can you can be a perfect uh, runner and a resilient person without being that and uh, a bodybuilder is not j even just you know killed by 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 firearm but you know it can easily get killed by you know even a spear just a very a few centimeters in inside the body, you know, can hit the vital bases. Human body is always, even the strongest person in the world, one of the weakest and most fragile and insignificant, you know, forms, the, the you know, material forms that you can ever find. 
And if you go to war, you must also know that you go there potentially to be physically, you know, dismembered. And that's exactly what happens. And you don't come like, you don't come back like before. Like this sacrifice is not a bet in the sense that, okay, now we'll hope that things will get, you know, will will be get better. Yeah, of course you you hope that, but when you go through certain things, you know, at this point, I think the military allows just a few tens of days, some tens of days of combat, to be someone psychophysically fit for for combat, right? Um, it, obviously, in the kind of wars we we fight regularly, because you know, if, uh, hypothetically, a third world war broke out, we would fight in not a very different fashion from World War the Second, because the way our militaries are shaped today are for you know very very limited uh, employment, um, aside from you know from specific, uh, actually from the United States that has the only army that is basically capable of fighting in, the, in all the different uh, parts of the world and for the greatest endurance, but, you know, look at in Europe, we, we, if we were to fight with, you know, the, the kind of equipment and training and, and quality that we deploy in our, you know, uh, regular interventions today, well, our budgets as states wouldn't last a few weeks, right, <laughs> with that level, you know, in a war. Um, so, um, naturally, it's different, but what I, I wanted to say is that, um, you get weary, right? After a few tens of, of days spent, you know, without sleeping, under uh, under mortar fire, not knowing where the enemy is, being scattered, um, you know, cold, uh, scared, etc. You you suffered that. You you get broken, like you can't be fixed um, anymore. You can get slowly better, but that thing changed your life forever, your body forever. You're not the same person. You get worn out, right? It's normal. Uh, you know, the the, the body uh, wears down. It, it gets the destroyed over time. That's 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 nature, right? And going to war is definitely not one of the best ways <laughs> to preserve your psychophysical integrity, for that matter, right? This is not an insult, all right? It, it's a it's a pretty serious problem, and every mil military man is aware of this, and it's a very very important problem. And that also tells you the dimension of sacrifice that the military makes in this regard, because they they do go there knowing what awaits them, especially today, where you know we raise awareness also about certain um, darker sides of, of, of the sword, of course, and also. This awareness, in fact, an army which looks upon all its toils and the means of victory, not as a curse which hovers over its standards. Right? Um, so, think about how soft we are, on average, in the civilian world. Right? Um, I, I had a tiny, tiny, tiny military experience. And uh, in, 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 in that time, my mindset changed forever. Like I see things now in a way that you know I can't even think what a what a full you know military man of career can see, because that is mind blowing, right? And if you look at the sheer you know inertia and laziness and and weakness and cowardice and um, logical, r rational, intellectual inconsistency of the average person is, you know, civilian world worldwide, wherever, this, this is not a, you know, saying the, the military is better or worse, this is saying the reality is like this, like, as a civilian, you're not pressured as much as you are in, in a military training and in a military life, right? Um, this naturally, is always speaking on average, um, but the point is that uh, this inertia and laziness is manifested at a moral level in the sense that the, the soldier with a military virtue in this regard, so not all soldiers definitely, but possibly who, who is called for, you know, for necessity and therefore historically speaking being part of also of communities that didn't war go to war will willingly or happily, would, would start seeing sufferings as saying, ah, oh, things are going bad. As if war was something where you know you could do without fatigue, without strains, without sufferings, without pain, um, without fear. 
Well, the person who is not virtuous, militarily speaking, will think that uh, there is a curse on the army for that reason. The expert military man sees that, the virtuous military man actually, sees that as this is, we're doing well because we're really consuming these resources. We're really doing what we need to do. And the, the way we should value all of this and its outcome is it's, uh, it's very, it's, it's on very different bases. Right. And also, this beautiful terminology now, the von Clausewitz says, you know, a virtuous army is the one that is remembered just by one idea, right, one word, um, and it's a very simple one that is the honor of its arms. When we talk about honor, militarily speaking, this can have historically many meanings, uh, but what, the, what von Clausewitz addresses here is the universality of this pride um, in, in this Prida Corp uh, and in the, in the sense in the love, unconditioned love that the, the military has towards the uh, his army, right? This exists also at, at very different levels, right? It can be more or less um, uh, instinctive, right? The, the brotherhood in arms is, you know, it's witnessed uh, also at its strongest and at its simplest, though, in its more, you know, passionate sense in, in small units, right? Um, the honor of arms conceived from from a general's point of view, is a much more enormous deal in terms of political and social consequences, and in this sense, is also much larger. But the whole thing is enough to keep in the military virtues army the whole thing together, and in basically rendering all of the sacrifices worth, including death, as we have seen before, uh, even at the point of self annihilation. Think about the old guard of Waterloo, right? Uh, you know, when, when you're offered to leave and what you want is to die, it's because you live within the unit now. You are the unit. So you can't leave going on by saying, you know, we, we don't exist anymore because we have failed. Because all this had no sense. Because we, you know, someone, we can think that someone has suffered the same thing we did. Because nobody can know that. Well, this is this is also interesting. We could debate it, but just to make you understand um, the the depth of such sense of honor, the honor of of arms that is um, has had many uses, right? Also, you know, uh, also out in fact of the military sphere per se, but that is something that exists within and and with which um, that represents the true military spirit right in, in a virtuous arm however von Clausewitz also sheds light now on another aspect that should never be forgotten because he says soldiers may f fight bravely like the Vandans and do great things like the Swiss the Americans or Spaniards without displaying this military value this military virtue excuse me this is tr absolutely true, right? Here, the Van Dans were, uh, uh, as you as you know, the you know the the, the peoples of Brittany that revolted, um, uh, Brittany and the lower Val uh, Loire Valley that revolted against uh, you know the, the French Republic, that kept fighting for its own uh, autonomy basically, and and, and died courageously where were destroyed. In a way, the Swiss here is referring to the, yeah, I think probably not just the 15th century, but it was probably 14th and 15th century. The Americans, as naturally the uh, the rebels to the, to the English. Um, the Spaniards, I presume here quite clearly at the time of the Tertium, right? But von Clausewitz says this all can happen necessarily, um, let's say, uh, without military virtue per se, like you can find very brave peoples that are not necessarily these ones. I mean, he made the, this example by s stating that you can find great examples of value, and there are val different shades of this. It's, it's obviously that the Tertia, for example, had a military value, a military virtue, 
right? Uh, excuse me, I keep saying volume instead of virtue, but military virtue in the way we have described. Also, the Swiss in the 15th century had differently from the one of the 14th in many ways. Uh, but uh, the point here is uh, be aware that you can win even if you do not actually display this virtue, right? The, the virtue here is the optimal, right? It, it's it, what von Clausewitz said, you know, you, this is what a, a true army should be about, but true uh, armies, in fact, in reality, are something different, right? There is always a, a maximum and a minimum. Also, it's, it's difficult in this regard to, right, it's not, there is, there is a level beyond which you have reached uh, uh, an absolute uh, level of virtuousness, right? Th this thing swings all the time, and also the greatest army can, can break at some point. Um, and be and not being up to the task so this all depends on the context um, also von Clausewitz says a commander may also be successful at the head of standing armies like Eugene and Marlborough's um, without enjoying the benefit of its assistance that is to say there are certain military systems that are very well developed uh, up to one point and kind of gone by themselves but that uh, do so because there is an apparatus behind it to make it work that um, you know also are ho commanded by the, the same we'll see next time better the, the role of commanders in this that can you know compensate in terms of especially in um, what would be called as conventional warfare right instead than fighting against guerrilla the kind of the, the greatest influence on, on the troops their armies may not have this military virtue per se, right? There may, there may actually not be anything specifically uh, virtues about certain victorious armies per se. Yeah, they kind of worked well, but let's not exaggerate right, about their cohesion, right? Naturally, even for Eugene's and Marlborough's armies, that this, this is debatable in a measure. You know, up to which point do you have to consider this uh, this limit where where is that something begins and the other stops and you know it also gets and this naturally has to do much with the the role of the general it's important to to repeat it to stress it because the general in, in that case has um, the the greatest uh, impact at some point or at least um, uh, a, a prominent for a prominent force that can surpass also the the, the military, uh, the presence or the lack of military virtue within the army. And von Clausewitz says, we must not therefore say that a successful war without military virtue cannot be imagined, right? This is very important, right? We don't have to idolize uh, a military achieve, I mean, the, the, the quality of a military system just because, you know, it, it kind of won. Right, there are certain episodes, historically speaking, which you see that yeah, there were certain armies that were kind of fine, and we can appreciate the fact that it worked fundamentally well, but we still don't see them briding um, in a in a more than much, especially compared to others. Um, this is naturally connected to a lot of other factors outside the military. Yeah, you can't explain. I don't know, as we were seeing last time, you can't explain. Roman expansion in Mediterranean. If you pretend to explain, uh, I mean, if you pretend to to identify the, the the response just in you know its military system, because what its military system anyway, if there is not a political or social one behind that, right? This is very debatable. There, the, there has been a huge debate, and and positivism and mechanicism have, have done enormous mistakes in in observing history in that regard. That that is, you know, if a system wins, it's also because it it's intrinsically superior. Um, it's it's debatable. Like von Clausewitz is actually very positive about the the idea that the result per se has always a, I mean, presents the historian always with um the military historian with um I mean the outcome proper presents the military historian with a an element that cannot be simply surpassed, like saying you have to explain why a system lost and you can't simply say you know it was better but it was unlucky let's say that is even if it, that was true which happens um you know it's it 
it's never that simple because every single factor is intertwined one and second also how can you measure that and third uh, you know if yeah if they were really superior why did they lose anyway too right is it possible the lack lack of you know wh what is that actually brought to that defeat? I mean sometimes it's very evident there are macro strategical movements that brought to an army to be annihilated because they, they you know someone screwed up in, in command or something but but even that is a part of the army after all so anyway um, it, it's all yeah and it's a very good exercise because it really teaches you not to banalize um, military analysis just by saying you know it, it you know it's because if that factor had gone in another way that these explanations are always very convincing right they're not and in any case they're never like clamorously um, you know if there are two systems that are being compared from a military point of view it, it's there is never historically one system that is overwhelmingly superior to the other because guess what you need also motivation to go out there to be butchered uh, and uh, you you kind of understand also what an enemy is before you you test him on on, on a battlefield on a pitched battle let's say um, to I mean to realize for example that you're you're done for if you meet him in open ground so you should never there, there's a bit of sensationalism that that emphasizes the fact that you know that is even positive in a way to explain history that is to say that they, they have you know the weight of a loss for example how brutal that can be right but you shouldn't emphasize too much the fact that this was necessarily caused by one factor that was absolutely decisive and that it that's easy to find no that that can be said not even on some of the most successful military models there is always and especially if you make a serious in historical inquiry always something that tells you you know what yeah this thing fared pretty well but if you look at all the various things that could happen after all or might have happened that we can't see from the sources for example well you know what maybe this is not so excessively different or or you know radically um you know determining right it, as we we were thinking it to be um in and Foucault then says and we draw a special attention to that point in order uh, the more to individualize the conception which is here brought forward that the idea may not dissolve into a generalization that it may not be thought that military virtue is in the end everything this is very 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 important right you can't think that uh, in for it says it, it is not so point um, so this remark is great right you can't find even the greatest army ever being destroyed and not necessarily this thing will pass through a uh, you know some you know something exceptional from the other side because th seeing it like that it, it's like highlighting uh, you know it, it's as if you had a flat view for which you had to make a merge the single factor because you can't explain it otherwise and the reason why you have that flat view is that you don't realize how flat it, it's actually not how you can't really determine what the hell was going on and how many factors were interplaying at the same moment right this is what military history teaches you Mil military history homogeneizes let's say all this thing by showing you that military differences are relative are very relative within the the uh, the dimension in which war is waged right and von Clausewitz writes however military virtue in an army is a definite moral power which may be supposed wanting and the influence of which may therefore be estimated like any instrument the power of which may be calculated right so yeah th this basically means that it uh, you know for this moral force we have to uh, looking at the, the previous chapters you know we have to count them as individually non decisive right they are all part of a of a greater wall that is in part impossible to understand 
but that in part can reveal us the, the importance of every single of these aspects without this, this uh, let's say disjointing them and um, and pretending that one factor is rationally isolated from conceptually isolated from one another right so okay Today my English, I think, was terrible, but uh, next time we will see on how to get this mill for virtue practically. Uh, and uh, but w for now we we'll stop it here. But this was a very dense chapter, and I think it has a lot to 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 say. Um, and when we will complete it, we will understand it better. Anyhow, for now, we'll stop it here, and I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like, or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time, and see you next time.